we're going to speak for the next three weeks about uh, optimal uh, emission reduction. And we're going to start today uh, in three parts. We're going to talk about the internationally agreed uh, targets, and there's more of that in the book. I'm going to talk about cost-benefit analysis. I'm going to talk about coal benefits. I don't think I need a full two hours for this. So I'm also going to make a start uh, with uh, discounting so that I have more time next week to delve into uncertainty which students tend to find hard uh, and equity. Um, but first, uh, let's talk about um, what has been agreed internationally what we should do about uh, climate change. And I'm going to start with Article 2 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, agreed uh, way back when in 1992. Um, eight years before you were born? Something like that, right? Um, <clears throat> and Article 2 of the UNFCCC says that the ultimate objection of this convention is to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Such a level should be achieved within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally, uh, to ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. Um, and this sounds very agreeable, right? We should not do dangerous things, which is a very prudent uh, attitude. Um, but it actually doesn't say a whole lot. The first sentence is just said, we should not do dangerous things with our climate, right? Which I think you agree on. Uh, and then uh, the second sentence actually tries to specify what is meant by danger. Uh, and there's three clauses in there. Uh, and the first clause is that ecosystems should adapt naturally. Which, of course, begs the question, what do we mean by an ecosystem? Um, and it also, which is not a legally defined term, and biologists actually can't agree on what an ecosystem is. Um, uh, but it also begs the question, what do we mean by natural adaptation? Um, and if you look uh, at uh, the period where we came out of the last ice age, um, the so-called Younger Dryas, we had a period of very rapid cooling, followed by a period of very rapid warning, warming. And this happened for natural reasons. The cooling was when the Laurentide uh, ice uh, lake uh, drained into the North Atlantic. Um, and then this is the bounce back of that. But very rapid warming for natural causes. And obviously, our ecosystems, many species are genetically much older than uh, the 10,000 years or so, 12,000 years, 14,000 years ago that this happened. Um, this was actually the cooling. <laughs> this was the warming, sorry. Um, so is this what they mean by natural adaptation? Should we be able to withstand the warming at the end of the younger dries again? It doesn't seem to constrain us a whole lot. So perhaps the second, um, uh, second clause is more constraining. We need to ensure that food production is not threatened, which I guess all of you uh, agree on. Um, because most of us would like to eat uh, every so often, right? And it would be good if food production is not threatened. But it doesn't specify the nature uh, of the threat. And I talked about this, uh, but I did not show you uh, this particular graph. What you're looking at at the top left is land use in a scenario without climate policy. Uh, and what you see here in this light green is bioenergy crops. So essentially seed crops, uh, rapeseed, and those sort of things that you can then press and make uh, biodiesel uh, from, uh, but also fast-growing trees, poplars and willows, and that sort of stuff, uh, or fast-growing grass that you can uh, chop up and throw into what used to be a coal-fired power plant, right? Uh, that is something uh, that we do at the moment. 
not at a very large scale, uh, and we might do more in the future. Now, this is without uh, climate policy. This is with free variations of climate policy. And what you see is that, at least according to this model and this parameterization, those bioenergy crops are going to take over the world. And essentially a whole lot of land will be devoted uh, to this, which immediately puts pressure in this scenario on forestry, right? Essentially, we're going to convert forests into plantations. We really want that. We don't want ecosystems to be threatened, recall. Well, this is a clear threat to ecosystems. Um, but it's also going to take away uh, cropland. Um, and that, of course, is going to drive up the price of, um, of food. Now, this is not a picture of the future. This is a picture of the past. Um, because of the bioethanol mandate in the United States, a whole lot, around 25% of the maize crop in the United States is diverted to ethanol production away from making tortillas. Uh, and that drives up the price of food in Mexico. And what you see here are the food riots in Mexico of about 10 years ago. Um, uh, the food production not threatened? Do we mean that climate policy should not threaten food production? Or do we mean that climate change should not threaten food production? Probably both, right? So this does not really pose a constraint on climate policy either, right? Uh, and economic development to continue in a sustainable manner, of course, that means, yeah, climate policy also threatens economic growth, right? So, when you read it like this, Article 2 of the United Nations Framework Convention is motherhood and apple pie, right? It's the sort of language that, at the surface, everybody can agree on and 192 countries in the world have ratified the UNFCCC. Uh, so everybody can agree on this ultimate objective because essentially anybody can read into this what they want, right? Which is of course the art of diplomacy to say something that means different things to different people and everybody agrees on signing the statement. Or so they thought, right? Uh, I know the authors of Article 2 are fairly well. They really uh, thought that this was the end of it. Uh, but there is one word in the first sentence that actually means a lot, and that is stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations. Now, <clears throat> to see that, we need to go back to uh, the carbon cycle. And what you're looking at here is a first order difference equation. We talked about those before, where the atmospheric load or the atmospheric concentration depends on the atmospheric concentration in the previous period. And then there's some natural depreciation going on uh, in the form of delta. And then, of course, we have our additions in the form of our emissions, right? So let's assume that the atmospheric concentration of CO2 is governed by this equation. Now, what does stabilization mean? Stabilization means that things don't change, right? So the atmospheric concentration at time t is equal to the atmospheric concentration at time t minus 1. Or we can replace this difference equation that we have here with the same equation without the time subscripts, right? Things don't change. So why have a time subscript? So we have uh, L is delta L uh, plus M. We can solve that for L. And what we find is that M uh, is equal to, or L is equal to M uh, over 1 minus delta. We haven't learned anything, right? We don't know what the constraint on L should be because Article 2 is so very vague. And there is a direct relationship with our emissions M, but that's it. But I did not tell you the full story uh, of the carbon cycle. Um, I showed you a, a, a cartoon that is very similar to this. This is an older version of the one I showed uh, before, where we have the stocks of CO2 in the surface ocean and the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere. In black, the past. Uh, in red, the addition since pre-industrial times. Uh, and then the arrows are the fluxes, right? Uh, where I said, well, uh, <coughs> the terrestrial vegetation, plants, um, 
essentially uh, emit uh, about 120 GPP, oh, okay, uh, 120 uh, gigatons of carbon every year, but then they also take up, and that's mostly um, when they die back in fall, uh, but when they grow back in spring and summer, they take up about 120, right? Uh, that is uh, the story that we talked about before. Uh, and then, of course, our concern is our emissions from the stock of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. Um, so we talked about that, uh, but what I did not talk about was this arrow here. And you may have thought at the time, well, I did not talk about this arrow, even though I saw it, because this number 0.2 is so very small compared to the, all the other numbers that we see, right? So we have 120 here, we have 70 here, we have 6 here, so who cares about the 0.2? Um, but um, a small fraction of the CO2 in the atmosphere is taken out of the atmosphere by a process called rock weathering. Um, and essentially this is a chemical reaction between certain types of stone with the atmosphere. And through that the stone grows and takes up CO2 removes the carbon from the atmosphere and sticks it in the rock. And this process is as fast as rocks grow, which is not very fast, right? You have never seen a rock grow. Um, but it does happen, and it happens at a geological time scale, and that is why that number is so small. Um, and this matters. This matters quite a bit. Um, the model that we're using in the, uh, in the seminars is the so-called Meyer Reimer Hasselmann um, model of the carbon cycle. Uh, Ernst Meyer Reimer on top, Klaus Hasselmann won the Nobel Prize last year. Yes, uh, not for his work, but for his work on, on climate change, um, on climate models, not for his work on carbon cycle models. Um, say, well, we should not see the atmospheric concentration of CO2 as governed by a single first order linear difference equation, but by a set of five such equations, right? And that is indeed how we model the carbon cycle uh, in week one, um, where the key difference between the previous uh, slide is that we now partition the emissions uh, by this uh, factor alpha, where of course the alphas add up to one. Um, and then these five boxes have their own characteristic half-lives. Uh, so about 17% um, has a characteristic half-life of uh, one half, right? So you emit a ton of CO2 and then you, half of that is gone Next year, three quarters of it is gone. In two years, 87.5% uh, uh, is gone. In three years, and so on and so forth, right? That is how uh, you should read these numbers. <clears throat> um, and then you have other characteristic half-lives. And then you have your rock weathering, which governs about, which uh, captures about 13% of emissions. And rock weathering is a geological process so at a human time scale, it actually does not disappear. This CO2 stays in the atmosphere on a human time scale practically forever. So your delta is one, delta five is one. <coughs> so what does that mean for uh, the analysis that we did, just did? Well, uh, L is delta L, uh, T minus one plus M, stabilization, so we drop uh, the subscripts T, so the solution is L is M over one minus delta. The delta is one we are dividing by zero, which is never recommended. You can't solve this. There is of course an alternative solution to this, uh, to this right? If L um, must equal delta L, and delta is 1, then we have L is L plus M, and the solution to that is that M must be 0. 
So because part of the CO2 is removed from the atmosphere by a geological process, stabilization of concentrations, which has been signed into international law uh, around 1994, was agreed in 1992, implies that CO2 emissions have to go to zero. Now the people who wrote Article 2 did not realize this, I can assure you. Um, most of the people who argued that, desire that, that, that the UNFCCC should be ratified did not notice uh, either. Right? This was signed into international law without people realizing what they were doing. But CO2 emissions have to go to zero. That is international law. Um, the para the um, Rio Agreement, uh, the UNFCCC, only says that emissions have to go to zero, but doesn't say when. Uh, but the Paris Agreement does. Uh, so we have the Rio Agreement says emissions have to go to zero, and then we have Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. That actually put numbers uh, on this. This agreement is aimed to strengthen the, uh, the global response to the threat of climate change by holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial uh, levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature uh, increase to one and a half above pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. So now we have a target, not only that emissions have to go to zero, but also that emissions have to go to zero at such a point that the temperature stabilizes below two degrees and preferably near one and a half degrees. Right? Uh, and that is the international agreement uh, that we have. Uh, the book has uh, pages and a half or so about where the two degrees comes from. Um, um, won't go into that. Will we meet this target? No. Um, um, what you're looking at here is um, a piece of work that was published in 2018. Um, and it is um, a bit of a peculiar uh, way of thinking about this. So if you have a target, say, of 2 degrees Celsius, uh, that means that you can only emit so much CO2 and then you will cross it, right? And that is the so-called carbon budget. You can calculate the carbon budget for hitting 2 degrees um, with, an, uh, I believe, an even with a, yeah, roughly an even chance, slightly more than even then we can emit some 1,500 additional uh, billion tons of CO2. Uh, if we want to hit the one and a half target, then we can emit maybe 500 uh, additional, 500 billion additional tons of CO2. Right? That is just an inverse calculation from the climate model that we have. Um, and this was in 2018, recall. Now, so this is the target. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, a very crude uh, assessment of the capital stock. And the assumption here is that if we take our power plants as they were in 2018 and we run them to the end of their economic lifetime as it was before climate policy, so Gas-fired power plant lasts about 25 years. Uh, Coal-fired power plant, 40 to 60 years, right? That is the lifetime uh, of these things. If you make that assumption that we run these plants to the end of their life, and we use them as we have always used them, um, and we do the same with the cars that are on the road. Cars have a lifetime of 10 to 20 years. So we take the existing car stock and we run them to the end of their life, and then at the end of their life we replace it with something that does not emit CO2, right? And we do that with all our machinery uh, and so on and so forth. Um, now if you do that analysis, then you come up with an estimate of the so-called uh, committed uh, emissions. 
and that is what you see here and is broken down by sector. This is the electricity by far the biggest because it has the longest lifetime. Um, stuff in industry, road transport, as I said, cars don't live that long uh, as uh, power plants and so on and so forth. And you come up with these numbers and what you find is that our committed emissions are around 850 uh, billion tons of CO2. No, actually a bit less uh, than that, because the 850 that you see here also includes 190 of things that have not yet been built, but have been announced. That planning commission is there and so on and so forth, but they haven't been built yet. And if you add that, you come to the 850. Uh, so this is here uh, broken down by uh, sector. And then here you see the same numbers, uh, but broken down by country, where by far the biggest is China. Uh, India follows and uh, not, well, India follows with some distance uh, behind. Um, so what does this imply? This implies that if you want to go to one and a half degrees, then you can only emit 500, but we have already committed to 850. So the only way to get to one and a half degrees is to strand a lot of these assets, to stop using them before they reach the end of their economic lifetime. That means that a lot of investors are going to lose their shirt over this, right? And it's not investors in the UK, but it's in China and in India. So it's essentially, if we want to meet the one and a half, hit the one and a half degrees target, then the Indian government will essentially have to bankrupt the whole number of captains of industry. That is what you need to do to hit the one and a half degrees target. Now, that's a political question, right? been following uh, India, then you know that the Indian government is not very good at standing up to Indian industry, right? Um, Chinese government is better uh, at that, but given the current economic problems, <laughs> I would not uh, count on them uh, bankrupting uh, many more countries and many more companies uh, because they have trouble uh, enough. Um, so this is one and a half degrees. And I mean, this was 2018, right? What has happened since 2018 is that a whole bunch of countries have announced more coal-fired power plants to be built. Like, uh, so actually, your committed emissions now are bigger than this, and our budget, of course, has shrunk uh, by four years. So no, we're not going to hit uh, one and a half. That's just the plans of last year, the slogan of the uh, conference of the parties in Glasgow last year was to keep one and a half degrees alive, which it wasn't ever alive, right? <laughs> um, but uh, that's uh, politics uh, for you. But th this is the, the political rhetoric. I personally think that we're also going to sail right through the two degrees target um, and we're going to stabilize uh, someplace higher than that. So this is the political story, right? This is what the agreed targets are. Um, let's look at what uh, economists have to say uh, about this. Now, in environmental economics that you could not take, <laughs> we have two classes, two whole classes about cost-benefit analysis. Um, and I'm going to very quickly run you uh, through this. Um, before I turn to uh, climate uh, policy. So, um, what is cost-benefit analysis? Essentially, you want to maximize uh, something. Um, so on the uh, horizontal axis, we have some notion of well-being uh, or gain or utility, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then on the vertical axis, we have our emissions. Uh, we're talking uh, CO2, so we're talking energy, right? Uh, and then the brown curve are your private uh, gains from emissions. And that is, of course, you don't gain from emissions. 
you gain from living in a comfortable apartment with a nice temperature, right? That is where your welfare comes from. And if you use no energy, it's freezing cold, so you're very unhappy. And then you're going to turn on your heating, and it becomes warmer and warmer and warmer. You become more comfortable. Um, but of course, also, you're spending more and more money uh, on your gas and electricity bill. And uh, you don't like that. So at some point, you're going to stop heating your apartment, right? You're going to heat it to 17 degrees or 18 degrees, but not to 25 degrees, because that is maybe uncomfortable, but it's definitely too expensive, right? Uh, so that is the, this point here. And that point is where the benefits of living in a comfortable temperature and the costs um, of heating your house uh, balance or, or equate to the margin, right? And uh, you find the optimum in your curve. Um, so Q prime are your uncontrolled and um, your emissions without policy. Um, and as I said, that is exactly where that curve hits its optimum, which is of course where its first partial derivative hits zero, right? So the dashed curve here is just the first partial derivative of the solid curve that you see there. Um, that is not the end of the story. There's also social costs of your emissions, in this case, climate change. Uh, if there's no emissions, uh, there's no cost, uh, but the more you emit, the greater the impact of climate change will be, right? Uh, and that is the green curve that you see here, and that is here shown as it's always damaging to your well-being. Um, so, there is a graph missing. <laughs> um, one way uh, of finding where do these two balance is if you take the first partial derivative of this one, so the slope of this curve, the green curve, and the slope of the brown curve, and find where do the two uh, equal uh, each other, right? That is the optimal point. Um, and that is the same, and this is the missing graph. Uh, that is the same where the first partial derivative or the slope of your net welfare curve uh, hits uh, zero. Those two statements are equivalent. Uh, so that is the optimal point that we're looking for, where the marginal costs of uh, emission reduction, so this is how much we would emit without climate policy, and then we push our emissions down, we use less energy, more expensive energy, and that comes at a cost. Um, so uh, that is measured in uh, this direction, um, are equal to the marginal benefits uh, that are in the green curve, right? And where the marginal benefits equal the marginal costs, that is where we find our social optimum. Um, and that is essentially cost-benefit analysis. That's, and I really spent four hours talking about that. <laughs> environmental economics, uh, but that is essentially uh, the whole uh, trick. Um, now, this is a static uh, story. So in a static optimum, uh, the marginal cost should equal the marginal benefits. And this would be true for noise pollution or something like that. Um, but that is not what we're talking about here, right? Um, um, but. I do need to show you the math a little bit. Come in. Um, so in the static optimum, we want to find where the marginal costs equal the marginal benefits because we want to maximize welfare, W, uh, by choosing emissions E. Um, and welfare is defined as the benefits of uh, the emissions, so the comfort that we have from living in a warm house minus the cost of heating our house. Um, and then the costs are, do I do this right? No. Uh, the benefits, um, it, it doesn't matter at the moment, but it will matter on the next one. Uh, the benefits are the avoided impacts of climate change. Um, and the costs are the costs of doing so. Um, so this is what we want to maximize, right? Our net benefits. 
Uh, and you do that by setting the first partial derivative of this thing. It's an unconstrained optimization by setting the first partial derivative of this thing to zero, um, which is the same as db dE minus dc dE equals zero. Then we bring one to the other side of the equation. Marginal benefits should equal marginal costs, right? So this is the same as the graph I just showed, but now in terms of calculus, right? Um, now, this is what you would do with noise pollution, a static problem. Um, in a dynamic problem, uh, you can't do this because you need to work with a net present, uh, net present welfare rather than welfare. Um, <clears throat> now, the way we typically do this in climate change is a bit of a shortcut. Um, we assume that the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere is a stock problem rather than a flow, which is true. Uh, and we also assume that emission reduction is actually a flow problem. We assume that the capital stock in uh, power generation doesn't matter a whole lot. This is a simplification. And you'll actually be grateful for the simplification uh, because the math becomes uh, easier with this particular assumption. So one is a stock and the other is a flow. Um, so what do we want to do is maximize, maximize not welfare but net present welfare, which is defined as the sum of the discounted stream of benefits. So we have the benefits of uh, avoiding climate change or reducing climate change, which depends on our emissions in the year that we measure the benefits, but also in the emissions the year before, and the emissions in the year before that, and the emissions all the way back to, actually, all the way back to 1850. But we, of course, cannot control emissions in the past, so those are sunk uh, costs. Um, so our benefits uh, depend on our history of emissions, uh, but our costs only depend on our emission reduction or our emissions in that particular year. Right? Um, so this is the benefit, net benefit at time t. Then we want to consider all points in the future, right? So we sum over that. Uh, and of course, we have to discount uh, the whole thing, 1 plus r to the power t. Divide by 1 plus r to the power t, not multiply. Um, right? Uh, so how do you do this? Well, uh, you take the first partial derivative of benefits and the costs, and you set them equal to each other at every point in time. <clears throat> So the marginal costs are simply dc dE, right? Just as we had before. But we do this at every point in time, and we're interested in the present value, so we discount that with 1 plus r to the power t. Um, so this is now your expression for the marginal costs for emission reduction uh, at time t in the future. Now, the benefits of this are how much do the impacts of climate change change at the margin um, at time t plus s, at some point s in the future, as a function of our emissions at time t, right? So we cut our emissions in 2022, and then we have benefits of that in 2022, and in 2023, and in 2024, and so on and so forth, right? That is what the s does. These are the costs uh, that we incur in 2022. This is the benefits that we incur uh, in 2022 plus the benefits in 2023 and 2024 and 2025 and so on and so forth, right? All at the margin. And of course, all this counted, right? And then we do the same for the costs in 2023, right? because we do this for all t. That's what the upside down a means, for all. Um, 
And then we have the benefits in 2023 and 2024, 2025, and so on and so forth, right? All this counted back to the year 2023. Now, this equation can be simplified a little bit because here we have S plus T, which of course uh, we can uh, single out uh, and bring to the front of the summation sign. So we have one plus R to the power T here. We have one plus R to the power T here. So the discounting actually cancels there, right? Um, and what we have is this particular expression. Um, that the marginal costs of emission reduction at every point in time for all T should equal the stream, the sum of the discounted stream of marginal benefits from that point onwards into the future. Right? So that is the cost benefit uh, condition for a dynamic problem. And now you're happy that we assumed uh, that this was a flow, right? Because otherwise you have a summation sign here as well. Um, now, you know the answer to this question already. You may not realize, uh, but you do. Um, I think it was in week three that I showed you a table with the marginal costs of emission reduction. And here is the same information, but now as a graph, um, where essentially what we have on the vertical axis is the carbon tax. And then on the horizontal axis, we have, well, if we impose a carbon tax of 100, then according to the median estimate of the numbers that I showed you uh, in week three, um, we end up at some 575 uh, parts per million CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, right? That is how you should read this graph. And I showed it the other way around, right? I said, well, if you want to hit uh, this particular target, then this is the carbon tax that we should impose. Right? If you want to go for 400, then you should impose a $1,000 per ton of C uh, carbon tax. But of course, you can read this graph the other way around as well. Right? If you impose a $1,000 uh, $1, carbon tax, then you get to 425 rather than 400. Right? So I gave you um, that number. I also showed you a variant of this one. Uh, what is the social cost of carbon? Right, we talked about that two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we said, well, the best guess of the social cost of carbon is maybe 20, maybe 30 uh, dollars, right? Um, so if we combine the two, then <coughs> this is the so it's the cost of carbon, 40, oh, 25, sorry, there'll be 40 in the next slide. Uh, so that gets us to 650. In order to meet the uh, Paris targets, we need, uh, and I did say this before, uh, we need to stabilize concentrations below 500, uh, and that means that we need a carbon tax um, somewhere between $500 and $1,100 per ton of carbon, right? So the cost-benefit analysis does not really support the targets in the Paris Agreement. Now, <clears throat> this is a very rough and ready way of doing a cost-benefit analysis. Um, the uh, sort of standard uh, for this is the work by Bill Nordhaus of Yale, um, and uh, he built the so-called uh, Dynamic Integrated Climate Economy Model, uh, which is an integrated uh, assessment model that in many ways is very much like the ones, the one you guys have been building. Uh, there's a few more bells and whistles uh, in Nordhaus's model, uh, but there's also one important bell that is actually missing from uh, Nordhaus. So in some ways you're more advanced uh, than what he is doing. Um, and in 2018 he won the Nobel Prize uh, for this, which some people uh, thought surprising. Um, <laughs> and uh, the main purpose of this work uh, was to find 
optimal climate policy. That is essentially um, what Nordhaus did. And you know the answer already because I gave it to you. Um, so the carbon tax that Nordhaus imposes, um, no, I forget in which paper this is, um, is actually starts at around $40 uh, dollars per ton of carbon, not the 25 that I just uh, gave you. Uh, and then it increases uh, by around 2% uh, per year uh, to hit uh, 200 in the year 2100. And you know what's going to happen, right? Uh, this is going to cut emissions uh, and it's going to cut concentrations. In black, you're looking at the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere without climate policy. This, of course, is an assumption of a, a whole bunch of uh, assumptions about a scenario. Uh, and then in green, you're looking at uh, the atmospheric concentration with optimal climate policy. And of course, you impose a carbon tax because climate change is a problem. It has a positive social cost of carbon, right? Climate really does harm at the margin. Um, but, uh, and as a result, you make emissions more expensive than they were. As a result, you're going to cut emissions. But what you can see is that we're nowhere near stabilizing uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, right? So that is essentially uh, what Nordhaus this and did. Here you see a picture of 20 years ago. Um, and essentially Nordhaus asks the question, if the world were ruled by a benevolent dictator, by a philosopher queen, what would she do? Right? <clears throat> And the answer is not a whole lot. I used to call this philosopher Queen Galadriel. Uh, and that was sort of the original talking depiction of Galadriel, or somebody who is wise and very powerful, but doesn't do a whole lot. Of course, now we have the rings of power, and Galadriel all of a sudden becomes very active. Um, complete contrast to canon, right? Uh, but that doesn't matter. So I won't call her Galadriel anymore. Just refer to her as an anonymous uh, philosopher queen, right? Um, <coughs> and essentially, what uh, this benevolent dictator does is uh, the three things that you see here: uh, a little bit of emission reduction in the beginning, more later, uh, but not nearly enough to stabilize concentrations, right? That is essentially the policy recommendation that comes out of Dice. Now, um, the first part of this conclusion is robust. It doesn't matter what you do with your model. Almost doesn't matter what you do with your model. You always start slow and then accelerate, right? And that is because we actually talked about this. So much of your emissions are set in stone that you don't want to begin with a big policy shock. You want to start slow and ramp up, right? Um, that just follows uh, from the capital stock turnover. How fast you want to accelerate that's not robust at all. You can change your discount rate, you can change the parameterization of your carbon cycle, you can change this, you can change that, and you will find very different answers how fast you want to accelerate, right? Qualitatively, you always want to accelerate. Even if your name is Gernot Wagner, then you still want to accelerate. Um, that's an inside joke. Um, <coughs> but how fast... Um, you can't really uh, <clears throat> turn that around. Uh, the final part of the conclusion, and this is what upset a great many people, that you would never do enough to stabilize concentrations, that is actually fairly robust. Um, so Nordhaus first published this in 1992. Um, and ever since, people have been trying to overturn this particular part of the conclusion because it's so such an affront to anything that uh, environmentalists uh, stand for uh, that it would be optimal to have continuous climate change um, <clears throat> um, that uh, by this 1992 right by now three four generations of uh, economists and environmentalists have tried and failed to show not how it's wrong um, and the reason that it is so hard to overturn this conclusion is the basic structure of cost-benefit analysis, right? So these are our uncontrolled emissions. This is zero emissions. 
Um, <clears throat> and the optimum lies somewhere in between. And why is that? Well, if we don't control emissions, then we emit Q prime, and then we start cutting our emissions, right? And in the beginning, that is simple, right? Because I talked about how a lot of energy is simply wasted, right? So you can essentially cut that at very limited cost. Uh, so you first gonna address waste, and then you're gonna decarbonize the electricity sector, which we now know is actually fairly easy to do, and it's not at all expensive. Um, and then we want to decarbonize uh, uh, private transport. So we want to get people out of their cars and onto bikes and onto public transport, <laughs> hard. Uh, <coughs> and we want to replace their cars with electric vehicles, which is easier, but also uh, hard. Um, <coughs> so it becomes more expensive, right? Uh, and then at the very end, we want to decarbonize aviation. So next year, they're gonna open uh, flying car taxis, flying taxis in Paris, right? Where you can actually have an electrified uh, plane, but only for f a few kilometers from the airport to the city center. And it will only take two passengers, right? Uh, so we're getting there towards electrification of aviation, but to fly a jumbo jet with five, uh, with 300 passengers with electricity, no, right? <laughs> Not for decades. Um, uh, and then of course the hardest problem of all is how to decarbonize uh, space flight. Just no idea how to do that, right? You can of course argue we can do without space flight, like what is the point? of uh, sending uh, people to the moon. Um, but of course, without space flight, you won't have satellites. You may of course argue, we have plenty of satellites already. Satellites have a half-life of around 10 years, right? Or a, a lifetime of around 10 years. So if you stop shooting satellites up in the sky, then in 10 years time, there won't be any left, right? So that means that your GPS uh, and everything stops working. Uh, so cutting the final bit of CO2, the going from the 95% emission reduction to 100% emission reduction is gonna be very hard and very expensive, right? So this marginal curve is always shaped like this. A little bit of emission reduction is cheap, a lot of emission reduction, 100% emission reduction is very expensive. Um, <clears throat> and the marginal benefit curve, the green curve, always looks like this, right? Because, I mean, if you don't control emissions at all, then perhaps the world will warm by seven degrees, which would be fairly costly. And then pushing emission or pushing climate change down from seven degrees of warming to six degrees of warming. Six degrees of warming is still fairly bad, but not nearly as bad as seven degrees, so that brings huge benefits, right? And then we push emissions down further, and then we cut warming from five degrees to four degrees and from three degrees to two degrees, and the benefits are not that large anymore. And then we push benefits or push warming down from one degree to a half a degree, and from half a degree to 0.1 degree, and from 0.1 degree to 0.01 degree. And do we really think there will be huge benefits from that if the world were not to warm by one and a half degrees, but by 1.4 degrees? No, right, so the benefit curve comes pretty close to zero, if not to zero, if we fully eliminate emissions, right? <clears throat> so the simple logic of a cost-benefit analysis is that you almost always go for what mathematicians call an interior solution. You won't go for the corner, unabated emissions, because climate change is bad, but you also will not go for 100% emission reduction because the final bit of emission reduction is so very expensive and the benefits are almost nil, right? Uh, so it is very, very difficult to overturn um, Nordhauser's conclusion. Now, Nordhauser is a smart guy, uh, so he did it. As I said, generations of economists have uh, tried and failed. Um, to disagree with Nordhaus, and the only one who succeeded in disagreeing with Nordhaus is Nordhaus himself. Um, 
unless there is a so-called backstop. Now, what is a backstop? Uh, um, so, um, and we're talking about a backstop to fossil fuels or to uh, CO2 emitting uh, energy. Um, now, carbon-free backstop is a source of energy, so far so uh, uncontroversial, uh, that does not emit CO2 when used, right? We can agree on that, that there are such things. Um, <coughs> that carbon-free backstop should become competitive with fossil fuels, should outcompete fossil fuels at a certain carbon tax that is less than infinitely high, right? At some carbon tax, these sources of energy should compete with fossil fuels. Again, completely uncontroversial. Um, the third assumption uh, here is a bit more controversial. Uh, this carbon-free backstop has to have such an abundant supply that its supply curve is essentially vertical, that you can supply more and more and more of this without adding to the costs at the margin. That's a bit peculiar, right? Because if we think of wind power, right, this is a carbon-free uh, source of electricity, yeah, it's pretty cheap now to make electricity from wind, but we got to build wind turbines at those places where there's a lot of wind first. And at some point those places are full and then we have to start building wind turbines in places where there's less wind and therefore it will be more expensive or in places that are further away from the demand for electricity. So the transport and the transmission of electricity will become more expensive, right? Uh, similar leave for solar power. At the moment we put solar panels on roofs and the opportunity cost of roofs is essentially zero, right? Because we don't use it for anything. But at one point your roofs are full and then you need to take useful space and put solar panels there. And then of course you have an opportunity cost. So the idea that you can just keep on supplying this stuff without adding to the costs is actually a pretty strong assumption. Um, but the... Uh, final assumption that uh, you need to make um, is that ye, this backstop will continue to compete even if the carbon tax goes away. Because if this carbon-free backstop comes into the economy and starts outcompeting fossil fuels, then emissions <coughs> go to zero climate change will stop and there is no justification for a carbon tax anymore, right? Because the problem is solved. Why would you tax a non-problem? And actually there's no CO2 emissions to tax, right? So you know, just uh, carbon tax would disappear. And then you need to make the assumption that the economy will not bounce back to fossil fuels. That is the final assumption that you need to make. And this is a particularly controversial assumption. Um, because if we are going to do this, right, then we're going to cut all our uh, fossil fuels out of the energy system. And we do that at a point, presumably, that the world is not too hot, so there's a lot of fossil fuels left in the ground. And we're never going to use them again, even though we know exactly where they are. We have all the technology to use them profitably, right? And depending on how fast you do this, but if you do this fast enough to leave some of the Saudi oil in the ground, then this is a very tall assumption, right? At the moment, it costs the Saudis four or five dollars per barrel to get oil out of the ground. Currently, they're selling it for $200, right? So $195 profit per barrel, uh, which is a pretty good deal, right? Um, but in the future, Saudi oil production will still be at $5, right? <laughs> so it's not just that your wind and your solar need to compete with the $200, $200, and, uh, 200 
uh, dollar barrel of oil, you also need to compete with a five dollar barrel of oil now and in the entire future. So this is a pretty tall assumption, but if you're willing to make this, then indeed your emissions go to zero, also in a cost-benefit analysis, then it is optimal uh, to do so. So, um, <coughs> that was um, Nordhaus. So, we're gonna break, okay. Um, we're not gonna break because I forgot this final uh, sentence. This is all for one philosopher queen. In the final week, we're going to redo this now with 200 philosopher queens, each ruling over a particular country, right? Uh, that comes later. What we're going to do after the break uh, is look at co-benefits. Okay, 35 minutes, 40 minutes left. Um, <clears throat> I hope to do two more things. One is called benefits, the other is the Ramsey rule that you've heard about but haven't seen. Um, <clears throat> so, why co-benefits? Um, this is a very old cartoon. I believe it's 1992 or 1994. Uh, it was published in the uh, New York Times uh, by Joel Pet. No, in the USA Today uh, by Joel Pet. And we are at the climate conference, um, and the speaker there is saying we should cut the emissions and blah, 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 blah. And then this middle-aged white guy, and it's always a middle-aged white guy, stands up and says, what if climate change is a big, ho big hoax, and we're all doing this for nothing. Uh, and then the speaker points to a range of other things, uh, energy independence, pres preservation of rainforests, green jobs, livable cities, clean water, uh, healthy children. And the suggestion here strongly is that there are other reasons to cut greenhouse gas emissions that are just as worthwhile or maybe even more worthwhile. And definitely if you hear politicians speak about climate policy, then they often justify it in these terms, rather than this helps reduce climate change, they say we're gonna create green jobs, right? Uh, that's definitely the rhetoric of the current and the previous three or four, I lost count, uh, governments in uh, the United Kingdom, as well as in the EU. President Biden also actually talks more about the co-benefits of climate policy than about the climate benefits of climate policy. <clears throat> um, so the question is how true is this? Um, how important are so-called co-benefits for climate policy? Um, and uh, I'm going to do this um, with some calculus. I also have some graphs, uh, but um, I'm going to do it with some uh, calculus, um, mostly. So, we have two things that we care about, uh, so-called criterion emissions, and we're gonna call them G and A, where G stands for greenhouse gases and A stands for air pollution. Um, and we're gonna look at them as emission reductions rather than as emissions. Uh, so we have benefits uh, from this, we call the benefits B, and uh, everything is linear, uh, just to keep it simple. Uh, for now, everything is linear. Um, so uh, that is simply how much we care about uh, greenhouse gases measured by chi, how much we care about air pollution measured by alpha, and those are our total benefits. Um, then what we have is that our emission control, uh, our emission reductions for G, for greenhouse gases, depends on our efforts for uh, Climate policy are, as well as our effort for uh, air pollution policy, S. So essentially what we have is that if we cut air pollution, we also affect our greenhouse gas emissions, right? And similarly, if we cut greenhouse gas emissions, we make an effort R, then also our air pollution changes, right? Depending on the size and sign of the parameter tau. Uh, so that is the structure of uh, the problem. And then we have costs of uh, emission reduction. 
which are a quadratic uh, function, just to keep things simple, uh, half uh, kappa s squared, uh, half lambda uh, r squared, right? <coughs> so, the um, benefits are here. This is uh, how g and a depend on our effort, s and r, so we can uh, substitute that in here. And then we have the benefits uh, function that looks as follows. Our benefits uh, depends on how much we care about climate change, chi, times how much our effort, R, affects climate change. That is given by rho. Uh, but we also have that if we cut uh, air pollution, do, 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 no. <coughs> so, okay. so this is a uh, climate benefit, right? Uh, we also have that if we cut R, or if we make an effort R, I should say, then we also cut air pollution by the amount sigma, and alpha is how much we care about uh, air pollution, right? So this is our co-benefit. Um, or oh, this is our co-benefit, sorry. Uh, and then it also, it's a completely symmetric problem, so it also works the other way around. If you do air pollution, we also affect our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so these are our benefits, these are our costs. These are our benefits, these are our costs. I just copy the equations. So the optimal control rate for uh, greenhouse gases is by the marginal benefits equal to marginal costs. Marginal benefits, very simple, right? Oh, it's, it's a linear equation. Uh, alpha tau plus chi rho. Marginal costs. Uh, this does not depend on R, this does. So this becomes lambda, right, times R. That's why the half is there, so it cancels against the two. Um, so our optimal control for uh, greenhouse gases is chi rho over lambda plus alpha tau over lambda. What does this mean? Chi is how much we care about climate change. Rho is how much our actions affect climate change. And the greater the effectiveness, the more we do, right? And the more we care, the more we do. Uh, and the lambda is what it would cost us to cut our emissions, right? So the greater lambda, the less we do. So this makes perfect intuitive sense. Um, alpha is how much we care about air pollution. Tau is how much our climate action affects air pollution, right? So we have a... Uh, <coughs> Okay, uh, and this is the same thing, <laughs> but now in words. Um, so we have a, what you would think is a co-benefit, right? If we care about air pollution, if alpha is greater than zero, uh, and if our emission reduction of greenhouse gases affects air pollution, reduces air pollution, then we should cut our greenhouse gases by more, right? And even if this effect disappears, we should still cut our greenhouse gases. Now, graphically, this looks um, as follows. <clears throat> so here we have our marginal em emission reduction costs. Yeah, marginal cost of emission reduction. So we have emissions on the vertical and the horizontal axis. We have costs at the vertical axis. Uh, so the more we cut, the more expensive it gets at the margin. We assume there's a quadratic relationship, so the margin no cost is linear. That's what we see here. And then we have this linear benefits function, so we have constant marginal benefits. So this is the assumed benefit of greenhouse gas emission reduction, right? And then this is the optimal point. Uh, this in blue line here is the co-benefit or the secondary benefit or the ancillary benefit, and people call these things by these three names. Um, and if we assume that it is positive here, then we simply need to add those two, and we have this line for our total marginal benefit, and instead of cutting emissions to this point, we cut emissions, this should be emission reduction, uh, we cut emissions to uh, this point, right? So far, so simple. But this assumes 
that this is indeed a benefit, right? Now, air pollution is bad for you, so the alpha is positive. Reducing air pollution is always good. Um, but is your tau positive or negative? If we assume that our tau is not positive but negative, then we have a secondary loss, and then we have this line here, and we should work less hard on our emission reductions for uh, CO2, <clears throat> right? Um, so the key question is, is this tau, as you see here, is that positive or negative? Do we add to our benefits at the margin or do we subtract from our benefits to the margin? Uh, now an example where tau is positive is if we switch from coal to gas. Now I told you in week two that for every kilowatt hour of electricity that is made from coal, you emit about twice as much CO2 than for every kilowatt hour of electricity that is made from gas, right? So switching from coal to gas reduces greenhouse gas emissions. We talked about that. Now, Coal is dirty, gas is clean. Because of chemistry, uh, most gas that comes out of the ground is almost pure CH4. Most coal that comes out of the ground has all sorts of other stuff in there. Particularly, it has a lot of sulfur in. And if you burn coal, then you don't just form CO2, but you also form S2O, sulfur. No, you form SO2, sulfur dioxide, um, which is a precursor to acid rain. It kills fish, it kills trees, and that sort of stuff. Uh, damages buildings, uh, damages human health as well. So here we have a very clear co-benefit, right? If you switch from coal to gas, you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions and you reduce your acidifying emissions. Very good. You also reduce soot and all those. Um, so, clear goal benefit. Another way of cutting your CO2 emissions is to switch from petrol engines to diesel engines. That is because the diesel engine is much more fuel efficient than the auto engine that burns petrol. For some reason we call petrol petrol and diesel diesel rather than petrol, auto, and diesel, diesel, right? That would make much more sense, historically. Um, <coughs> and that means that if you switch from petrol to diesel, you emit less CO2 per kilometer driven, because these engines are simply more fuel efficient. However, petrol burns a lot cleaner than diesel. Diesel engines generate a lot of NOx and other soot particles that petrol engines or auto engines do not do. So here we have that if you switch from petrol to diesel, you reduce your CO2 emissions, but you increase your particulate emissions. And then we are in this situation here. So we have a negative co-benefit. It's a co-loss, it's not a co-benefit, right? Now, when you were young there was all this scandal about uh, Volkswagen claiming that diesel engines or their new diesel engines were so clean and then it turned out that that was because they had falsified the numbers rather than that they were really clean. Now that may be uh, a bit too old for you. Uh, what we see at the moment, and this is a picture from last year, uh, is that people are cutting their CO2 emissions by burning wood at home. And because wood is sustainable, it, the trees grow back and suck the CO2 back out of the atmosphere. Yes, if you switch from burning gas or burning coal or burning oil to eat your home to burning wood, you reduce your CO2 emissions. But um, the stoves that people burn in don't burn very hot, not in the sense that you should put your hands on, right? But they don't go up to uh, 1,000 degrees or so. So you don't have complete combustion, and if you put a, a, a carbohydrate uh, into a burner and you don't burn it 
at a high enough temperature you have incomplete combustion and that means that you generate all sorts of soot particles and carcinogenic particles. Right? And these things cause cancer and these things cause asthma and these things are bad for you. Right? Now this was last year. Um, by now, or by then, uh, wood burners are responsible for about half of the air pollution related uh, cancer risk. Of course, this was last year because of the price of gas and the price of oil. People are actually burning a lot more wood this year than they did last year, right? But we haven't seen the data uh, come out of this. So, this is a very clear example of uh, a co loss, not a co benefit. Sorry, um, what would be the kind of adaptation in reducing that? Don't. Uh, don't. Uh, don't. Uh, don't. Don't. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't burn wood at home. Uh, I mean, there's also um, the Drax power plant. It used to be a coal-fired power plant, now runs on wood chips. They have proper kettles and they burn it, burn it proper hot. So there's not a lot of uh, air pollution coming out of those things. But you just can't get the temperature high enough in the small stove that would fit in your room. Just don't. Or gasify the wood before you burn it, which is also something that you can't do at home. <laughs> um, not at scale uh, and not safely. Um, so the advice is don't burn wood. Um, okay, um, going back to the cartoon that I started with, where the guy said climate change is a hoax, right? Then chi is zero, right? If climate change is not real, then we don't care about climate change, so this term disappears. But then you still want to cut your emissions provided that your tau is negative, right? Uh, positive, sorry. Right? So even if climate change were not real, if there are co benefits, then you still would want to cut your CO2 emissions. Now, um, <clears throat> the story is completely symmetric for the air pollution, where also you have things that actually work the opposite direction. The way we got rid of uh, acidifying gases, the way we got rid of acid rain, was by putting scrubbers on smokestacks. We essentially take the sulfur out of the flue gas before we dump it into the atmosphere, which works perfectly fine for combating acid rain, but this takes energy. So by putting those scrubbers on, A, you add to the cost of electricity generation, but also you divert around a third of the output of your power plant to scrubbing, right? So you produce uh, only two-thirds of the electricity of what you would without, um, without uh, scrubbing. This just sums up uh, what I just said. Now let's not do this. This is what happens if you have uh, a nonlinear system and the answer is things are basically the same, just the math is a bit more complicated. Instead, let's start next week's. So because next week is going to be a very full agenda uh, and that's why I want to take these 20 minutes uh, to start on that. So, uh, I talked about the very basics of cost-benefit analysis, uh, but I haven't talked about the ethics of it all. Uh, and that is what we're going to do now and uh, next week. We're going to talk about the discount rate, we're going to talk about uh, risk and uncertainty, um, and we're going to talk about uh, equity. And Marcos asked the question, what are equity rates? <laughs> and I will answer next week. Uh, this week I'll just talk about the remedy rule. So we're going to start with next week's uh, lecture. Um, 
And I'm going to talk about uh, the Ramsey rule. The basic tenet of the next uh, two and a half hours is uh, this, these two statements here, right? Um, climate change is a long-term problem. No dispute there. Climate change is a global problem. Also hard to disagree with that. Uh, and climate change is a fairly uncertain problem. And this is another empirical statement that uh, is simply true. Um, the second statement that you see here is uh, a normative statement. Uh, and what I will try and argue over the next two and a half hours is that if you do not care about the distant future, or you do not care about faraway lands, or you do not care about remote probabilities, then climate change is not much of a concern to you. And that is uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to show this statement uh, a couple of times, but we're now first going to talk about the distant future. Now, uh, <coughs> the way we prefer to think about uh, discounting of time is through the so-called Ramsey rule. And you see the Ramsey rule uh, here. Uh, the Ramsey rule is named after, not Aaron, but Frank uh, Ramsey, uh, who was a um, brilliant mathematician, uh, philosopher, and economist. Uh, he made substantial contributions to philosophy. Um, he wrote two great papers in economics. One is Ramsey Prizing, and the other is his mathematical theory of saving. And then he died uh, at the age of 28. And had he lived, he would have made uh, a great many more um, contributions. So I'm gonna, the, the Ramsey rule comes out of his theory of saving, which has a mathematical sophistication. It was published in, uh, Actually, I said he died in 1928. That's not true. He died in 1932. Uh, the, paper, the 1928 paper has a mathematical sophistication that we would not see in economics until the late 50s, early 60s, right? That's how far ahead of his time uh, he was. Um, and in that paper, and I won't take you through the derivation, uh, <laughs> I will talk about the derivation um, a little bit, uh, but in that paper he posits uh, the so-called Ramsey rule which says that the money rate of discount, R, is equal to the utility rate of discount, rho, plus the growth rate of consumption, G, times the curvature of the utility function, eta. That is the Ramsey rule. And I'm going to start with eta G. Um, what is that? Uh, discount rate for money or consumption, R, is equal to the discount rate for utility, rho, plus the growth rate of consumption, G, times the curvature of the utility function, eta. Um, and there's three components split into two uh, components of the Ramsey rule. And the first one, the eta g, says that we should discount the future because we will be richer and happier then. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, il best illustrated with this graph. <clears throat> On the uh, horizontal axis, we have your income. On the uh, vertical axis, we have utility. This is how happy you are. Now, what is saving? What you do with saving is essentially you give up current consumption, you put away money, right? Instead of uh, buying new jeans, you put the money in the bank. So that is the first act of saving. And then the second is that sometimes later, you take the money out of the bank and do something nice or useful with it, right? That is saving. So how does this work in this particular graph? Uh, this is your current income. You give up consumption, so that makes you less happy, right? Because you consume less. This is the amount of money you give up. This is the utility you lose. 
And then in return, later, when you're richer, presumably, you take the money out of the bank, and if, well, if there is a zero interest on uh, your bank account, or you put the money uh, in a mattress, then, and there's no inflation, uh, then this is the amount of money that you get back, right? That you get in the future. And the horizontal distance here is the same as the horizontal distance here. But because you have grown richer by then, the gain in utility is actually only this small rather than this large, right? <clears throat> So this is, if you do it in real terms, and there's no interest. Oh, this is a silly thing to do, right? Why would you save money now and essentially transfer that money to yourself, or rather to a future richer version of yourself? That would be absolutely silly, silly thing to do, right? And really, the break-even point is not where the money is the same, where the horizontal distance is the same, but the indifference point is where the vertical distance is the same, where your utility loss today is equal to or smaller than the utility gain in the future, right? That is essentially your indifference point. And at this point, if this is the interest rate that you gain, then you should consider saving your money, right? Now, the eta g is essentially the ratio of this horizontal distance over this horizontal distance. <coughs> and that obviously depends on two things. One is how curved is your utility function. And if it's a linear function, then actually it doesn't matter. And then your eta is zero. And it depends on how fast are you moving to the right? How fast do you grow richer? Right? And that is what the Ramsey rule says. That we should, or that there are Discounting, or uh, sorry, saving is essentially a trade-off between current consumption and future consumption, and that depends on curvature of utility function. How does money gain and losses translate into utility gains and losses? And it also depends on what is money actually worth to you. And this is actually fairly easily seen for you guys, right? Um, you're now a student in your final year. You're among the poorest of the poor in society, right? In a year's time, you'll be in the job, in a job, right? And you'll have an income of 35, 40,000 pounds. So putting aside 100 pounds today so that next November you have 100 pounds more is an absolutely silly thing to do, right? Emily is not convinced. <laughs> right? Because you will be so much, you can reasonably expect to be so much richer in a year's time that saving now for next year is just silliness, right? That is essentially what uh, the Ramsey rule, or this part of the Ramsey rule says. So we discount the future because we will be richer, or we expect to be richer and happier in the future. Right? That is largely uncontroversial. It's actually not entirely uncontroversial, because I just assume that we know the curvature of the utility function. Right? <laughs> actually, you don't really. Um, and also, <laughs> there is this G here, which measures the growth rate of consumption. That's not really what Ramsey said. Ramsey said, no, this measures the growth rate of things that we care about, right? Which, of course, is typically seen as material consumption or typically seen as income. But hopefully you would agree there is more to life than this, right? Uh, so G is really the growth rate of the things that we care about, not 
material consumption. Um, but so far, so uncontroversial. And the second part of the Ramsey rule, it says we also discount the future because it is the future. We discount utility because it we do. Um, and this is extremely, extremely uh, controversial. Um, essentially what it says that I'd rather be happy now than in the future. If you ask any philosopher, he or she will tell you, no, this is wrong. This is a sign of a lack of education. This is a sign of a lack of uh, self-control. You should not be like this. Um, if you ask any major religion, they will tell you, no, you cannot discount the future just because it is the future. We should not discount future happiness. If you spend this over generations, as we do in climate change, then essentially what you say is that people who are born later are less worthy than people who are born earlier. Well, I think is a good rule uh, compared to you guys, but you may disagree with that, right? Um, So every major religion, every major uh, system of ethics says we should not do this. But then if you look at how people behave, <clears throat> that is what we do, right? If you have a chance of, God, what are you guys, I am so out of touch. Uh, what are you guys longing for? <laughs> Nobody gives an answer, right? <laughs> um, I used to say, well, if you can see the next episode of Game of Thrones earlier, and we can see it tonight rather than tomorrow night, we would go for it, right? But that example doesn't work anymore. Um, <laughs> and that is how people respond, right? If you uh, ask, uh, if you give children a choice between do you want the marshmallow now or in 15 minutes, they will go for the marshmallow now, right? That's what people do. Um, so if you see this as a descriptive theory of saving, then your row is positive. If you see this as a normative theory of saving, then your row should be zero, right? Or according to some people, row should be negative. Um, now, this is not all that Ramsey did. Ramsey also did this bit, <laughs> that if your economy is in a dynamic equilibrium, then this rule of discounting that I derived from the perspective of a consumer and a saver will lead to the same discount rate as if you approach it from the other side as the demand for investment uh, in productive capital. In a dynamic equilibrium, the consumer theory of saving leads to the same result as the producer theory of saving, right? And that is what Ramsey really did. Um, now, does this matter for climate? Absolutely, I don't need to tell you this uh, because we've seen this. Um, I'm going to show this particular graph a number of times. Um, let's blow it up. There's going to be, as you may have guessed, three more uh, next week, but let's blow it up and look at um, <coughs> what it says and uh, what we have on the vertical axis is the social cost of carbon, according to a particular model and a particular calibration, blah, 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 blah. And what we have on the um, horizontal axis is the eta, which is also known as the error Pratt rate of uh, relative risk aversion. Um, and then in the different colors, we have different rows and the proper name or the jargon name of the row is the pure rate of time preference. This is a silly name, it's the rate of pure time preference, but historically the pure ended up in the wrong place. So people call it the pure rate of time preference, um, rather than the rate of pure time preference. Um, and what we see is that if your row is larger, then your social cost of carbon is smaller. So the green line uses a low row, 
the blue line uses a middle row and the brown line uses a high row. And what you see is that the social cost of carbon falls and unambiguously falls, right? And we've seen that in some of the exercises that you did. If you increase your discount rate, the social cost of carbon comes down. Then what we do here is we increase the curvature of the utility function. We make the row, uh, we make the eta larger. And if you make the eta larger, then essentially we discount the future harder and the social cost of carbon falls and falls quite rapidly, as you can see, right? <clears throat> so the choice of these two parameters, the rho and the eta, really matter for climate policy, right? Um, so the choice of these parameters is terribly important. And as I said, people strongly disagree <laughs> on these matters, right? Uh, on, the on, on the one hand, you have sort of the empirical argument that we all discount the future, and we all discount future utilities, so you can then make an argument of representative government, right? Uh, the government should reflect the will of the people, and if the will of the people is to discount the future, then perhaps the government should also discount the future, and then climate change is not particularly important, right? Because it's in the future. Uh, you could also make an argument that we should not be doing this, right? Because every religion, every philosophy says we shouldn't, so perhaps we should follow that advice, right? Um, and you have a problem then as well, right? Because the social cost of carbon is essentially our advice of what the carbon tax should be. It's no longer that we argue that people, as a philosopher or a priest perhaps should, that we should live better lives, we should be less sinful. Absolutely, that is something that I think everybody has the right to argue, that you should be a better person. Um, but now we're using it not to argue that you should better yourself, but we're saying well, the government should be doing different things, right? And then we're sort of saying, well, uh, the government should follow the Bible or the Quran. Eh, that gets a bit scary, right? <laughs> uh, because then essentially you get into a theocracy type of or sort of this paternalistic government, right? So this is also a very dangerous argument uh, to make. Uh, so this is extremely important and also unresolved, right? And actually I think it's not just unresolved but unresolvable. Uh, this is a dilemma that every um, every long-term policy uh, has to deal with in one way or another. So, <laughs> that was the first uh, chapter. Next week, I'm gonna try and square this circle, try to combine the empirical evidence with ethical guidelines, and I'm gonna half square it. <laughs> and then we're also gonna talk about because it's essentially this discounting business is a trade-off between our current poor selves and our future rich selves, right? That is the trade-off that we're talking about. Uh, I'm also gonna talk about trade-offs between the current poor and the current rich. And we're gonna talk about uncertainty where we're gonna make trade-offs between a rich future and a poor, poor future, right? Um, and then I'm going to put it all together. Uh, but that is all for next week.